Hi everybody, there are two major groups of unemployment, disequilibrium unemployment and equilibrium unemployment, also known as the natural rate of unemployment. And these terms refer to the labor market. So there are types of unemployment that can occur when the labor market's in disequilibrium and types that can even occur when the labor market's in equilibrium. Let's get into those types. There are two types that fall under the heading of disequilibrium unemployment. First of all, you have cyclical unemployment, also known as demand deficient unemployment. And simply put, this is unemployment that occurs in a recession when there is a lack of AD in the economy. So diagrammatically, a simple AD shift to the left will show the fall in real GDP, but we can link that to a rise in unemployment as well. Let's understand how precisely a fall in AD can mean higher cyclical unemployment. Well, we know that labor is a derived demand. Labor's demand comes from the demand for goods and services. So with lower demand for goods and services, there's gonna be lower derived demand for labor increasing unemployment, but also with lower AD in the economy, lower demand for goods and services, firms are not selling as much output, their revenues will be coming down. And so to keep profit margins at a decent level, firms are gonna to look to cut costs. And the biggest costs that firms have are labor costs. So that will mean sacking workers, getting rid of workers, reducing workforce sizes. And in that sense, keeping profit margins at a certain level, which will mean a spike in unemployment. So now guys, you can see why this is called cyclical unemployment. It's unemployment in the downturn of the economic cycle, a recession or the trough or a slowdown but also why it's called demand deficient unemployment, a lack of AD in the economy. And we think, well, what can cause an AD shift to the left? Well, all the factors we've learned already. So simply put, an increase in interest rates, a fall in income tax or a fall in corporation tax, a fall in consumer confidence or business confidence, a cut in government spending, a stronger exchange rate. These are all the generic ones. If you want to be more precise, just think big causes of recession like a housing market crash, a financial crisis, a banking crisis, a global pandemic is a big one, a stock market crash. All of these are very specific causes of recession will work as well. And quickly, why does this fall under the heading of disequilibrium unemployment? Well, Keynesians would argue that when there is a recession in the economy and there is a fall in demand for goods and services, there'll be a fall in demand for labor in the labor market. Think of this diagram here, labor market diagram. And picture this demand curve shifting to the left. What should then happen is that the market clears that existing excess supply and you'll see lower wages at a new equilibrium. But Keynesian economists believe that wages are sticky downwards. So the excess supply that's created when demand for labor shifts left remains. And that for them is cyclical unemployment. That disequilibrium remains. And hence, this is also known as Keynesian unemployment. The other type of unemployment within the heading of disequilibrium unemployment is real wage unemployment, also known as classical unemployment. And this is when wages are forced above equilibrium in the labor market, creating an excess supply of labor. Now we know whenever wages or prices rise above equilibrium, there will be an excess supply of labor. On this diagram, let's show that in action. So we have the labor market here, the price of labor, wage on the y-axis, and the quantity of workers or employment on the x-axis. We have a normal downward sloping demand curve for labor and a normal looking upward uh, supply curve of labor. Just bear in mind in the labor market, things are the wrong way around uh, that we're used to compared to what we're used to. So the demand for labor comes from firms looking to employ workers. The supply of labor comes from us individuals supplying ourselves for work. Where the two curves meet, you have equilibrium. I call that W star Q star. But let's say now that wages are forced above equilibrium. Call that wage rate W1. At that higher wage rate, naturally, firms are less willing and able to employ. So you see a contraction of labor demand, call that QD, but workers are very willing and able to work at high wages. You see an expansion of labor supply, call that QS. The difference between the two, QS and QD, is your excess supply of labor, excess supply, and that is your real wage unemployment right there. The difference between QS and QD. Now, why can this happen? How can wages be forced above equilibrium and not come back down? Well, if governments intervene with high minimum wages, that could do it, but also strong trade unions that push wages up can also do it. So they're the two types of disequilibrium unemployment. Let's now move into equilibrium unemployment. So this is unemployment that can occur when the labor market's in equilibrium. Now that doesn't make any sense intuitively because at equilibrium in a labor market at that wage rate, supposedly all workers who are willing and able to work are working. So how can there be unemployment? Well, there can be. My next video in this playlist is going to cover exactly how that works. So if we're saying even at equilibrium, 
there can be unemployment, there is always going to be a rate of unemployment in the economy. The best an economy can do is to achieve equilibrium in the labour market, but still there is unemployment. Thus, we use the term natural rate of unemployment for equilibrium unemployment. The best you can do is equilibrium in the labour market. There is still unemployment, so there is always going to be a natural rate. And there are three types of unemployment within the natural rate of unemployment. Three types that occur at equilibrium in a labour market. First, you have structural unemployment. This is simply the immobility of labour. We're going to cover that in lots more detail in a second, so leave that one there for now. You also have frictional unemployment. This is when workers are in between jobs. That's a nice way to look at it. So maybe a worker has voluntarily quit their existing job looking for something better. The period of time they're searching for something better, they're frictionally unemployed. Or maybe workers are already in their search, they're already out of work, and they're rejecting existing jobs that they could take, hoping that in a few days' time something even better will come along. Again, you're in between jobs, you're searching for a better job for yourself. The point is you're doing that voluntarily. That's frictional unemployment. And last type in the natural rate is seasonal unemployment, defined as when there is a temporary fall in demand for workers, maybe because of a seasonal change. So easy way to look at it is literally go to the season. So for example, if you're a ski instructor and it's the summer, well, there is a temporary fall in demand for your services in that time. You're going to be seasonally unemployed if you're out of work for that reason. If you're a fruit picker, you're going to be out of work in the off-season. If you work in the tourism industry, you're going to be out of work in the off-season as well, right? Seasonally unemployed, only a temporary change in demand. So in the natural rate, three types, structural, frictional, and seasonal. Let's understand structural unemployment in far more detail. Really interesting to cover this. The definition of structural unemployment is brilliant. It tells us exactly what it is in detail. So structural unemployment is the immobility of labour, as we said already, but due to a long-term change in the structure of an industry. Wow, right? So something fundamentally has changed about the structure of an industry, and because of that, there is now immobility of labour. What do we mean by immobility of labour? Well, there are two types. You can have occupational immobility and you can have geographical immobility of labour. Well, occupational immobility of labour is where there is now a skills mismatch between skills that workers have in the economy and job vacancies that exist. The skills don't match up and you have occupational immobility of labour as a result. So this is a skills issue. Whereas geographical immobility of labour is when workers are not willing or able to physically move to where job vacancies exist. Maybe they're not willing to move because of personal preference, because of family ties. Maybe they're not able to move because of housing infrastructure issues, maybe transport infrastructure problems, maybe cost of living differences. The point is they're not willing or able to move. They're geographically immobile. So these immobilities are because there has been a long-term change in the structure of an industry. Like what? What could have happened? Well, a major shock to an industry would be technology advancement, which automates physical jobs. Technology advancement, which replaces the need for physical labor. And we are seeing that all over the place, aren't we? Currently, we've seen it, for example, with banking, personal banking. A lot of that is now digital as opposed to going to physical branches. That reduces the need for physical workers in physical branches. We've seen it big time with farming. Farming has become mechanized, reducing the need for physical workers on farms. We've seen it massively with retail. The shift to online retail has been rapid, reducing the need for physical workers in physical stores. And we've seen it for the last few decades now, haven't we, with manufacturing and how a a lot of manufacturing jobs have gone as the production process has become automated. No better example than car manufacturing. The growth of robotics has really taken over, reducing the need for physical workers in factories there. So that's a massive shock to an industry, a massive change in the structure of the industry resulting in immobility of labor. So is number two. What a shock this is when an industry loses their comparative advantage. A comparative advantage is when an industry can produce a good or a service at a lower cost compared to a similar industry abroad. They are basically the most efficient producer compared to other industries abroad. But if that industry loses their comparative advantage to a foreign country, well, they are going to see a big decline in demand. They're going to see industry decline and with that structural unemployment, potentially both. Occupational immobility of labor, if the skills that workers have can't really transfer to other jobs in the economy, or maybe it's geographical. 
if those skills are transferable, maybe workers are not now willing to move to where those vacancies exist. We saw that exactly in the UK in the 1970s and 1980s. We lost our comparative advantage in manufacturing, especially to the Far East, with that big industry decline, especially in the Midlands and in the North. A lot of those workers became occupationally immobile. They couldn't transfer to new services, jobs that existed down South. But a lot of workers in the Midlands and in the North, they might have been able to transfer, but they weren't willing to move down South. So this is a huge shock to an industry, a massive, massive change. Of course it is, as the industry declines. Or maybe what's happening in the economy, as always happens, existing industries modernize, and therefore there is a need for new skills for workers to possess. Or maybe, as economies always do, they transition from one sector to a different sector. So maybe from primary sector production to secondary sector production, manufacturing, or from manufacturing to tertiary sector production, services, or from services to tech based production. Industries and economies always go through that shift. So maybe that's what's happening. And new comparative advantages are forming. And therefore, there is a need for new skills for workers to possess, to take those new job vacancies that exist. But the problem, it's the education system, maybe. That's not keeping up with the pace of change of skills needed in the economy. In developed countries, that can easily happen, or in high-end developing countries, that can easily happen. In maybe lower-income developing countries, it might just be a very poor education system completely. Maybe a lack of schools, a lack of teachers, poor quality education, which means occupational immobility of labour. So that, guys, is structural unemployment for you. You can see how much detail there is there, as well as understanding all the other types of unemployment. But you must stay tuned for the next video, very much twinned with this one, as we dive into understanding the natural rate of unemployment. I can't wait to see you guys in that video. Thanks for watching.